From this morning's gospel reading, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now Jesus is steadily, deliberately making his way to Jerusalem and his appointment with suffering and sacrifice. Just as we're only one week away from commemorating Palm Sunday, so today's gospel account takes place the week before his entry into Jerusalem. Speculation ran high. The religious types were tired of him and sought his demise. But the crowds were enthralled with him, which thwarted their desires to kill him. So tensions mounted. Jesus actually went across the Jordan to keep out of the religious type's reach. This was where his public ministry began after his baptism by John. Sort of what goes around comes around. And while Jesus and his disciples were waiting across the Jordan, word came that a good friend, Lazarus, was sick, on the verge of dying. His sisters, Mary and Martha, had sent word to him. When he heard the messenger, his response was, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. And rather than hurry off to Bethany, Jesus elected to remain exactly where he was, in, away from Judea, for a couple of days. And then he rose and began his journey. Let us go back to Judea again, back into a region where he was pressed by the expectations of the crowds and resented by the religious types the disciples understood the danger. Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? But Jesus had a journey to take and a schedule to maintain. What was coming was what he had prepared for his entire life. He tries to calm their anxiety, prepare them for what's coming next, telling them, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, well, let us also go, that we may die with him, because this was going to be a dangerous journey. Now Jesus and the disciples arrive in Bethany. It's just a couple of miles down the road from Jerusalem at a time when Jewish mourners were with the sisters. You know, the first time that we meet Mary and Martha, it's Mary who focuses on Jesus while Martha works to put things together for a meal. But here, it's Martha who leaves everyone behind to greet him. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Mary believed. She trusted Jesus. She knew in her heart he was capable of many things. That maybe if he had gotten to Bethany in time, her brother wouldn't have died. She was convinced that if Jesus asked God anything, he would get it. But she didn't know what to ask for. Jesus speaks of Lazarus living again, her mind races to the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus has something different in mind. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says to Martha, I am. And that's a very important statement. You see, in the Old Testament, when Moses asked God for his name, what does the Lord tell him? He says, I am who I am. In Hebrew, the word is Yahweh. In fact, the formal name of God is Yahweh Elohim. I am God's. So when Jesus says, I am, he's using the formal Greek translation of the Hebrew Yahweh, thus referring to himself as God. You see, the Jews would never use the word Yahweh when speaking of God unless they were reading the scriptures. 
they figured in their minds that as long as they didn't actually say Yahweh, well, then they could never break the second commandment by misusing God's name. So they would refer to God as Jehovah. But Jesus here breaks that protocol. I am, he says of himself. And as God, Jesus is the resurrection and the life, pointing to his power over death and life and life eternal, building upon his earlier promise, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. His response is telling Martha what he intends to do, though she's a little slow in seeing it. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is coming into the world. She had come to know and to believe that Jesus was the long expected Messiah, and she was confessing what was in her heart. Now Jesus goes on to the tomb and raises Lazarus from the dead, demonstrating that his word was certain and true. In a town only a couple miles away from the holy city and before the eyes of many Jews. The expectations of those who had been wondering about Jesus as well as the anxiety of the religious types who feared his popularity were going to clash with a cacophony of the cries of Hosanna and crucify him within one week. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. Words that he speaks that precede what he's going to do in raising Lazarus. There is no question Jesus was a man he was born, he suffered hunger and thirst, he suffered agony and pain, he died, he was buried. All of this is attested to in the scriptures, but is also referred to in the secular history of Josephus, a Jewish historian for, who wrote, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it is lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to himself many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, end quote. But the Bible tells us that he was also true God. John began his gospel account saying what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So as a man, Jesus would die on the cross. But as God, that death redeems sinners. Just as St. Paul told the Colossians, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. This was Jesus' purpose for coming to the earth all along. Even as he had told his disciples, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, true God and true man, fulfilled the law perfectly in our stead so that God's forgiveness would be given and our salvation made sure. For when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. As Jesus says of himself, I am. He backs up what he promises with the power of who he is. Jesus tells Martha that he is the resurrection and the life. And of course, he demonstrates that moments later when he calls Lazarus to leave the tomb alive once again. Two weeks later, he will walk out of his own tomb, just as he told the crowd after healing the blind man, saying, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. The cross is where he's headed. His tomb will only be a resting place. Just as St. Paul says, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Jesus' resurrection from the tomb demonstrates that he has the power over death and life, 
a power that he uses when it comes to the salvation of humankind. We will all face death. Some of us have experienced the death of loved one and people to whom we were close. Some of us have faced our own mortality only to be given a little more time on this earth. What Jesus says to Martha, he also says to you and me. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. While death will visit us all eventually, it does not have the final say. Even as the Bible declares, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, Jesus' question to Mary is the same question that we need to answer for ourselves. Do you believe this? If we truly understand that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, then we know that everything Jesus did, he did it for us. When he was ridiculed and scorned, he took it for you. When he was beaten and humiliated, you were on his heart and mind. When he cried out, Father, forgive them, you were one of those for whom he prayed. And when finally he cried out, it is finished. Redemption was completed for everyone in the room. And when he burst forth from that tomb on that first Easter morning, our salvation was assured for all eternity, even as he had promised, because I live, you also will live. In essence, Jesus is not just the resurrection and the life. He's your resurrection and your life. And when we die, our tomb will also be but a resting place for us. Until that day, when Jesus takes us to be with him in heaven. Since though we die, yet we die shall live. So send forth your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we may believe and live in Jesus Christ our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ unto life eternal. Amen. Let us